We can come to order. The Board of Trustees of Harris County Department of Education now convened in a regularly board meeting on Wednesday, October 16th, 2019 in boardroom at 6300 Irvington Boulevard, Houston, Texas at 1 p.m. I wish to extend a warm welcome to everyone present meeting of the Board of Trustees. A trust, as trustees, we are here to set goals, listen to reports from the superintendent, approve budgets, contracts, personal appointments, and make policy for the district. It is not the role of the board to make day-to-day -day operational decisions. The management and day-to-day -day operations of the department are the responsibility of the superintendent. We have policies and procedures in place to resolve concerns and issues. This is a public meeting of the board of trustees, not a meeting of the public. Prior to this meeting, board members received information related to items on today's agenda. Agenda items will not necessarily be handled in the order listed on the notice. The meeting is open to all who wish to attend and hear the matters discussed. During the course of the meeting, the board may determine that a closed session is necessary. In that event, the board will meet in a closed session to consider matters duly posted for this meeting as permitted under sections 551.071 to 551.084, inclusive of the Texas Government Code. I respectfully ask that you please refrain from talking while others are speaking and that cell phones are turned off or in the silent mode. Thank you for taking the time this afternoon to join us for and for your interest in the Harris County Department of Education. Uh, with that said, we'd like to, I'd, I'd like to ask Pam Shaw to come up and give us our invocation. Good afternoon. I'll try not to ramble too much, but I'm going to um, quote a scripture that is usually read at funerals, right? But I think it's just so, in no, 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 don't get sad, because I think <laughs> it has so many implications for our day-to-day -day life. So, but first I need to frame it, and it's about sheep. Um, you know, sheep are mentioned more than 500 times in the Bible. That's pretty incredible, more than any other animal. And since they call, he calls us sheep, I think we need to kind of know what sheep are all about. Um, you can't really drive them like cattle. They follow the voice of their shepherd. He leads, them, he leads them along tried and true paths. I was recently in the Middle East, and you can see the paths from years and years and years of shepherds herding their sheep. Very neat. Um, and they're true, and they're righteous paths. He leads them in still waters, and he lets them... Um, he leads them to waters they can drink from without becoming afraid because they're very antsy and they get very anxious and afraid. Um, he applies oil to their horns and to their head at night to keep the pest away. And then he uses his little staff to pull them into their folds at night. And he becomes the gate. So he, all these little sheep are gathered in this little stone area and the shepherd lays down and becomes the gate so that nothing can get to them apart from the shepherd allowing it, which is pretty fascinating. Um, and so having said that, I'm going to read the Psalm um, 23, it's the Psalm of David, and think about the shepherd and the sheep in a little different light, okay? Um, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me besides quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And if uh, Janae Edwards Miniel will come up. if you would join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And now the Texas flag. Honor the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to thee. Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Okay, this, we will now uh, open up for the open forum. We have one registered speaker, and that would be Colleen Vera. Good afternoon. My name is Colleen Vera. I'm a retired Texas public school teacher and an advocate for the taxpayer. Um, I'd like to speak today uh, uh, in support of item 7B and against 7C. They're related, so it's the same information. 
Um, I don't believe you should be using um, tax dollars to operate a nonprofit foundation which is not open to the public. You guys are elected. You operate and vote in public like you are today. Um, your records are open for public inspection. The Education Foundation is not. They don't allow the public at their meetings. They refuse to reply to any kind of inspection of even the minutes of their meetings. Then there's the issue of the purpose of a foundation. If you ask most taxpayers, they say a foundation is there for a school district to raise money, to get money from, from corporations and stuff, and have big fundraisers, and then they have grants and things that they offer the school district. So if teachers need to take a field trip, or if there's um, supplies that need to be purchased for some kind of special project, the foundation can help fund those things for money the school district doesn't have. Well, that's not how it works here. Even in 2016, the S Texas Senate Education Committee was shocked to find out that you guys use tax money to fund your foundation, which is opposite of what most people think. Um, at that time, though, you guys were very transparent. You used to have a page in your budget that said Education Foundation. And it told the public exactly how much you spent on the foundation. We might not agree uh, with it, but it was there. It was all totally open. Now that page isn't there anymore, so the public thought, that y'all quit funding it. Um, well, that's not true. The open records, we find out that you guys are paying for their audit. You guys are paying for the um, financial, what do you call it, the annual financial report. You're paying for their 990 preparation. You're paying for them to file their documents with the Secretary of State. You're paying for basically everything they're doing. And um, you're actually using HCD employees on taxpayer dime time to do this work for the foundation but there's nothing in your budget that shows that that's happening. I don't even know, I know the budget code that's used, but I don't know which budget that's actually coming out of. Um, so I don't think this is right. Um, I really believe that this present practice should stop. And um, you don't need to be paying extra employees to be the liaison, because your superintendent is a secretary of that foundation. And he speaks, every meeting he's gonna be doing it next is giving y'all a report. So he can be the liaison and report to y'all every single month and you know exactly what's going on with the foundation. So I would suggest that you don't need a liaison as recommended in I think 7B. Um, all you need to do is stop the money going to the foundation and if they don't know how to raise money then they need a new um, president or whatever they have and they need to get some people on there that know how to be a foundation and raise money so that they can be supporting you and the students of Harris County. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on, we have a recognition of Principal of the Month, Jonathan Parker. Good afternoon. Now, I know that each of you are aware that in order to have a great school, you have to have a great principal. And here at the Harris County Department of Education, we have four great schools and we have four amazing principals. And so we're standing in front of you today because October, the month of October, has been designated as Principals Month. So we would like to take some time today to recognize and celebrate uh, our fearless leaders. So the state of Texas does recognize Principals Month, and so we do want to recognize these individuals uh, with a plaque, uh, again, from our governor, Greg Abbott. And so, um, again, we celebrate you all this month. And so very quickly, as a senior director, I get to lead these individuals. Uh, Hold on, I thought we had four principals. We do. <laughs> oh, well, one's missing? One's missing. Okay, <laughs> I just made sure. But we <laughs> will recognize and celebrate him because, again, our principals are committed to leading those campuses. Uh, respectively, we had one individual who nearly had a finger bitten off, and I could not convince him to, to stay at home and rest for one day. Uh, he got stitched right back up and got right back into the building to support our students. And so. I'm proud to, uh, again, have these individuals as leaders on our campus in Harris County should also be proud. Thank you. Uh, got a question? 
get a photo? Uh, could you introduce each principal and tell their campus? Okay, we'll start with ladies first. Uh, leading uh, the AB East campus is Ms. Donna Trevino Jones. <laughs> Next up, we have our fearless leader of the AB West campus, Dr. Keyes. <laughs> and then leading Fortis Academy is Dr. Anthony Moten. And so we would, uh, board members at this time, ask that you guys gather in the middle and let's take a picture. While we're gathering, the principal that is missing is uh, Mr. Cooksey, the principal of our High Point East campus. If you can go back around, Dr. Mays, if you can go back by the suit, be great. Mr. Parker, if you'll come. Okay. All right, everybody, this way. All right, nice big smiles on three. Hold it, Mr. Moden. Tip your thing forward a little bit. There you go. All right, there we go. This way. One more time. Okay, here we go. And one more, one, two, three. Perfect, thank you. Super good, thank you so much. Okay, now we have the presentation of the 2019 Annual Achievement of Excellence in Procurement Awards, Dr. Jesus Amesqua. Thank you. Uh, we have an uh, uh, honor to uh, present to you the third annual, uh, uh, or this is the third award that we received in the, uh, from the National Procurement Institute. There were 202 recipients. There were 48 in Texas. 39 special districts and 42 counties. So we are one of 48 and one of 39 in the United States to receive the award. Um, this is for procurement award of excellence uh, for the Department of Ed for our procurement, uh, whether it be a choice or internal purchasing. And this is uh, Mr. Bill Monroe and his staff that uh, um, to present the, uh, the award. So um, I'm gonna thank uh, the divisions and, uh, and the staff for, for, for their hard work. So. Don't go too far, Dr. Amesqua. Presentation of the results of the fiscal year 2019 risk as awareness assessment. Um, yes, sir. On uh, page 15 of your of your agenda item, there's a report, uh, a risk assessment process. We do that uh, of our internal controls by every division. Um, and basically what you have is a summary of our results. Um, and there are eight uh, risk factors that we assess from in uh, internal controls to changing the uh, management and personnel, the nature of the cash transactions, the uh, complexity of the operations, competence of management, changing systems, uh, changing re regulatory requirements, and then the last times that we have reviewed. Uh, basically, we are uh, have 93 percent of our um, divisions rated uh, between one or two, which is a low risk. Six percent are uh, level three and then only 1% are 4 and 5, and there is a remediation or a additional work that is done uh, in training for divisions that are rated because of the nature of their transactions being a grant or a revenue-producing division. So this is just an annual update to the board. 
Uh, we do this every six months, and this is the one for fixed fiscal year 18 and 19. Okay, now it's time for our annual update from school-based therapy services. Thank you. <laughs> okay. That one? Okay. Thank you. The icons look different than I'm used to. Okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Carrie Crabb, and I am the Senior Director for the School-Based Therapy Services Division. Before I present our annual board report, I'd like to take just a moment to um, recognize my staff. Um, I have my management team and my um, um, administrative team here today. Would you guys stand? Additionally, we have 148 therapists who are working out in the school districts all across Harris County, and I would like to recognize that it is due to the hard work of all of them and their commitment to excellence. That is why our um, client districts and charter schools continue to come back year after year asking for our services, some of them for more than 40 consecutive years. So that's kind of impressive. <laughs> okay. So on to the board report. Um, our vision is to be essential partners, creating brighter futures for all learners, and our mission is to advance best practices for service delivery to benefit all learners. Um, thanks to uh, Dave Einsel in our communications division, we were able to partner last year with uh, Katie ISD and SciFair ISD to create an informational video that kind of um, depicts how we partner with our school districts and our teachers and help our students in the classroom. And I would like to share that video with you now, if I may. Might have to click on it. Oh, there we go. Oh, you like <laughs> it. Sweet soul, sweet soul. Okay, so you got to see some of our occupational therapists, our physical therapists, and our music therapists in action in the classroom, and th these were our, our therapists who work with th those particular children all of the time. 
What you probably didn't notice is that some of the adults in that video were teachers. They weren't all therapists. But I don't think you could probably pick out which one was a teacher and which one was a therapist. And the reason is because our therapists work in an integrated fashion. They're melded into the fabric of the classrooms and, and the campuses that they support. Last year, we had 148 therapists, four support personnel, and eight managers. And together, we served 7,732 students, 6,924 teachers and educators. Um, we also serve as a resource to our districts and our community. And one of the things that we're particularly proud of is our um, partnerships with our local universities and colleges. Last year, we were able to provide a training ground for 27 professional therapy students who were able to go out in the district and complete the fieldwork component of their professional education. This gives us a well-trained uh, pool of therapists from which to hire in the future, and we often do hire our students. We served 29 different school districts and charter schools last year, and you'll see a, a list of all of those in your packet. Our top five contracts were SciFair, Houston, Katy, Spring, and Spring Branch. Um, this is a breakdown of the uh, disabilities that the students that we serve have, and as you can see, autism is by far the uh, largest category of students that we serve. Each year, at the end of the year, we ask our clients to please um, rate how well we're doing. Um, we ask them to rate their level of satisfaction from one to four, one being very dissatisfied and four being very satisfied. You can see that over the past 10 years, we've come in very consistently very high with the last four years coming right under that 4.0 um, perfect score. Last year, they rated our overall quality at a 3.92 and value for cost at 3.75. Market trends and forecast. Uh, the division has seen an increase in the number of open enrollment charter schools requesting our services and this is as children with disabilities are finding their way into charters and charters are coming to us and asking us for their help, for our help. We've also seen an increase in uh, child find activities resulting from the 2018 um, TEA's corrective action plan when the state was found to have under um, represented the number of students in uh, special education. So as the special education numbers are rising, uh, districts are asking for more of our therapists to help them. Market competitions for therapy jobs continues to uh, be challenging for us. There's a lot of competition with the medical center for uh, therapists, and so um, we were able to uh, meet that challenge. We partnered with communications and client engagement, and we developed um, new and improved recruitment tools, including uh, videos of some of our recent hires giving testimonials about what it's like to work in schools, what it's like to um, work for Harris County. The video that you just saw also was um, something that we used to help recruit. So it's just something we're trying to stay ahead of all the time. That's all I have. Do I have any questions? I just want to say um, thank you, uh, not only as a board member, but a few years ago, my son was actually part of these programs. He, um, he's now a GT student, but once upon a time, he was a problem child. Um, and he was referred to your service, and we, we uh, as parents, were able to use your service. So I thank you for a couple of reasons, but, but thank you. I encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. Thank you very much. We definitely have students that we consider to be twice exceptional, so children who are both GT and have disabilities that we serve. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, next up is the annual update from Educator Certification Advancement. Linda Zetopek. Zetopek. 
Uh, good afternoon, esteemed boards of trustees. Uh, my name is Lydia Zaropek, and I'm the Director of Educator Certification and Advancement Division. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity today to share with you some of the highlights of the work that we do. Uh, but first, please allow me to uh, recognize my staff, without whom uh, none of this work would be able to uh, be accomplished. Team, please stand. So as a state accredited educator preparation program, our primary mission is to prepare the next generation of teachers and school leaders by offering a non-traditional alternative route to state certification. For the last five years, we continue to maintain the highest accreditation rating and nearly a perfect pass rate uh, scores on state exams. A hallmark of our program is the uh, extent of wraparound services that we provide to our candidates in an on-site interactive cohort-based format, as you can see. Uh, so we offer 11 initial teaching certificates ranging from elementary to high school, and we also offer two professional certificates, a principal and a superintendent, which is our newest recently added certificate, which I'll speak a little bit later about. Our combined total enrollment numbers for the last three years show a steady growth. These numbers include all candidates, both of those who started last year and in prior years, since our programs run between 11 to 21 months in a cyclical format. Last year, we enrolled a total of 41 new candidates, which included 11 superintendents, 19 principals, and 11 aspiring teacher candidates. Our candidates show strong performance on the state certification exams. We contribute the success to the comprehensive nature of the preparation programs and the intensive and personalized support we provide to each candidate. But the pass rates only tell obviously part of the story. Uh, during this past school year, our candidates and staff made a direct impact on 51 school districts across Houston area and beyond representing public, uh, charter, and private schools. We also provided knowledge-based educator licensure services to other organizations, including general public and the citizens of Harris County. The quality of our direct support services through field supervision, classroom observations, and coursework are evident in the client support and satisfaction results that you see here on the slide. And now for some really, really exciting news in the program expansion category. So we are very proud to announce uh, the latest addition to the suite of certification programs that we offer. Uh, this past February, the State Board of Educator Certification unanimously approved our comprehensive proposal to offer uh, superintendent certification program. The program launched in August uh, with 13 candidates in a cohort uh, and Dr. Shelley McKinley is leading the charge to provide exceptional leadership learning experiences to this inaugural group of district leaders. You can see a picture of them here. Uh, our principal preparation program also continues to turn out strong uh, graduates who are ready to take on the challenges of leading schools. This past year, we admitted 19 new candidates. One of the program components that makes us stand apart from other programs is the year-long action research project each principal candidate must complete. Dr. Cheney williams Ledet, that you met, is charged with leading this program and has done exceptional work in preparing our candidates to pass the new principal exam. Our teacher preparation program continues also to prepare high quality teachers who excel and remain in the profession. Uh, helping them remain in the profession after they get certified is one of our strengths. Since 2011, the majority of our teacher program alumni are still in the, in the profession and teaching in the classrooms. 
As a certification division, we also recognize the need to provide effective state exam preparation opportunities. This past year, we expanded our exam preparation offerings by adding boot camps to prepare for the new principal as instructional leader exam that uh, has gone into effect this last year. Uh, we also, our staff continues to maintain professional presence by serving on boards and presenting at state and national conferences, as you can see. And to keep up with the future trends listed here, we are actively monitoring the state's redesign of teacher certification and began the process of redesigning teacher preparation curriculum to align it with the assessments slated for implementation in the next 10 to 15 months. We see challenges as opportunities and are being very strategically proactive by calibrating our actions to be fully prepared for the ever-changing landscape in the field of educator preparation. And in closing, I've got a couple of highlights here. So we all know that the true measure of a program quality is evident in the demand for its candidates. So as you can see here uh, in these leadership examples that I pulled up, our graduates are accomplishing this. And also our graduates continue to be recognized at the state and national level as example of outstanding new educators. Thank you. Outstanding. <laughs> I do have one question. Yes. Uh, how many of the, that's me, I'm sorry, over here. So, so sorry. Uh, how many of the uh, uh, candidates do we ha know after they get their certification, stay in Harris County. Do we keep a metric there? Uh, so we can get that information. Uh, the state uh, keeps track of uh, in individuals who enter the profession, and there's probably a way for us to tease out where exactly they're staying. Excellent. Thank you. So Please do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay, next up is our superintendent, James Colbert. Thank you, sir. Uh, just a few things to update the board on. Uh, first, I, I want to speak to our principals and Principal Appreciation Month. Um, you know, principals are near and dear to my heart because I think it's one of the most challenging positions in public education. Um, when I became a principal, the first thing that I noticed is that it was far easier dealing with children than adults. <laughs> Um, which, you know, managing, supervising, encouraging, and leading and developing a number of adults is very, very challenging to do at times. I think that oftentimes people lose sight of the scope of responsibility of a campus principal. That person, the principal, is responsible for every human on that campus. Everybody, whether they're a visitor, a parent, a child, or an adult. Um, and that's not e an easy job. Um, our principals, are, I think, do an exceptional job because they get many students that traditional principals have decided that we can't do anything else for you here. And our principals don't ask questions. They take the student. And they inspire and lead um, and cultivate an environment and culture on their campus where the adults love those children. And we try to see the potential in them. Um, and so, you know, I really, Principal Appreciation Month, I, kudos to y'all, I tip my hat. It's something that I physically can't do anymore. I can't stand to do lunch duty anymore. <laughs> <laughs> or bus duty, or the lockers, or the textbooks, or handing out the keys, or dealing with basketball, football, baseball, you know, our guys, don't have, guys and ladies don't have to deal with that. But um, just hats off to y'all, and I, I really appreciate everything that you do, and I appreciate you being part of Harris County Department of Ed. So let's give them a hand once more. <laughs> Having said that, um, we had an opportunity to eat some barbecue. I believe it was brisket and sausage at the new home of the Knights. Right. Yeah, right. listen in. <laughs> Um, now, we didn't have any walls out there, but we did have some beams, and we had a roof, and we had some cement and some dirt and gravel. We had, Mr. Flynn was there. We had good weather and a lot of employees, but 
The progress, folks, on AB West is looking excellent. We had a PFC meeting today that went very well, and uh, everything is moving as planned. Um, I was shown photos, I think, yesterday that we they're actually putting bricks up on the wall. And so they're moving at a pretty fair clip, and so I think it's going to be a very, very impressive campus. Um, which just yesterday we had a meeting to discuss the um, playground that we're bringing out there that's going to be extraordinary. Uh, once we can get it looking exactly how it looks, but you're going to be very impressed with that, Dr. Key, certainly your staff, your students, and their parents. So that's going well. Um, we've had several events going on at HCDE over the past month. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we hosted the 2019 Leadership Symposium. This was uh, something that um, Dr. McLeod and her team have been working on since she's gotten here. Um, but it has cultivated to the level where we had, I believe, around 200, 300 educators, 300 uh, board members attended. But the biggest thing is we had um, an actual forum where we had eight superintendents participate on it. I had the pleasure or torture to try to moderate them. <laughs> um, ultimately, the focal point of that meeting or that um, forum was to talk about the impact of the new accountability system on their community and ultimately their school district. Um, a number of interesting personalities there, but they were all extremely honest. And I think that it was very beneficial and impactful, but it was more exciting seeing that Harris County Department of Education was the place where that meeting took place. So that was an excellent event. We also had a site visit last week from the Hanley Foundation. The Hanley Foundation is a foundation out of Florida that specializes and focuses on sobriety and recovery of people dealing with whatever addiction that they have. But they flew down to do a, a site visit at Fortis Academy. Uh, Dr. Moten and his crew did an excellent job. He's got his tour down pat. You know, he's got his whole route. You do like a figure eight and go back outside and bring them in. But the highlight of that visit were the kids. Um, it was powerful. First of all, they made a heck of a lunch. I don't even eat chicken pasta, but that chicken pasta I had was excellent, outstanding. Um, and we had a choice of chicken pasta or shrimp pasta. Of course, I asked for chicken fried steak, and she looked at me like I was crazy. Um, but the, it, was, it was powerful that we brought the kids out, and we gave them a round and thanked them for the meal. And one of the young ladies said, what, I don't get to make a speech? And we were like, sure, you can make a speech. And she looked at us and said, I want to thank you for making the school. I want to thank you for helping me. And prior to that, Dr. Moten had explained to us that child had only been there for about a month or so and had kind of went into detail the, the issues that she was dealing with in her personal life at home. But I'm telling you, almost everybody in that room started crying. I mean, it was powerful. And so, um, you know, we're having an impact on young people's lives. Uh, Dr. Moten sent me a text this morning telling me what his enrollment was, and while we were standing there taking a picture, he says, oh, we just got another one. So the enrollment is growing. I believe we're up to around 18 students, something like that, as of a few minutes ago. Um, but there was another profound statement that was made as the Hanley Foundation was wrapping up their tour, and they said that, especially a gentleman called, named Andrew, he's been all over the country to recovery programs in every state, and he said, y'all are the standard. There is not another one in the entire United States that looks like this facility. You're the standard. And so I think we have a lot to be proud of, and there's a lot of sweat equity that went into making Fortis and knowing where, where it aspires to be. So kudos to your staff and your crew out there. Excellent job. Keep it going, Dr. Moten. Finally, yesterday we hosted a school safety forum. That, okay, how many people did we have there, Dr. McLeod? About, uh, 238. Julia, about 238? About 238 folks out there, which was a mixture of principals, assistant principals. We had people from different um, police departments, school resource officers, captains, a number of things, really trying to lead the charge and taking a proactive stance to ensure that our kids throughout the entire county have a, a campus that is safe and they can go to without fear. 
And so the focus was trying to um, be proactive and look for the signs and find ways to ensure that we cultivate that type of environment while at the same time being able to react appropriately if necessary. But it was exciting to see so many people, you know, dialed into that and um, using, utilizing our facilities to be able to have that meeting. With that, that's all I have, sir. Thank you. Uh, next up is the report on feasibility. Don Sumner. Feasibility Committee had a meeting earlier today and we discussed various uh, items regarding uh, our cooperation and dealings with the uh, Educational Foundation and uh, I think it was a helpful discussion and we will be uh, covering those re our relationship with the Foundation and two agenda items to the, today. Thank you. Are there any other reports uh, from board members? I, I would like uh, Dr. Daniel Morris to uh, give us a report on his activities. So I went to, um, I was the delegate for the TASA, TASA, uh, TASA, TSB, Texas Association of School uh, Boards and School Administrators uh, Conference. Uh, this was uh, like three, three weeks ago, right after the last board meeting. Uh, got a chance to vote on behalf of HCDE and get a better, uh, they also had a number of workshops that I took, took advantage of and learned a little bit more about how everybody else is doing around the state because you have school, uh, school board members from around the state and um, some people sound like they have some interesting, uh, interesting times. We, we, uh, we have nothing on some of those, some of those stories so um, I hope to keep it that way but uh, so, but uh, it was a good learning experience. Um, I got a chance to see a couple of members. Actually, uh, Ms. Bro, uh, she actually is on a different school board. Uh, she, she works for HCD, but she also uh, is on the school board for uh, A-Leaf, A-Leaf school board. So we were sitting together because I don't, it was my first conference. I was like, I'm not sure how this voting thing works. I got, they gave us a clicker and all kind of other things that uh, <laughs> it was a certain way to go about it. But uh, it was a good time, very great learning experience. Uh, uh, definitely a little, little different. We're, we're, we're the only county school board in, in, the, in the state, so we're, we're slightly different. We don't have to worry about going to, you know, to the grocery store and, and having to duck out from parents like some other school, other school board members do. But it, it, it was definitely a, a great, great learning experience. Got a chance, and I, oh, and I got a great, uh, a great dinner from, uh, from our, our, our council. They, they took us out one of those nights, and I had, I think I ate so much, I had to go and, and like barely had to walk it off afterwards. So. But a great time overall, great learning experience, um, great food, uh, and, and, uh, and if anybody else gets a chance to attend, I think it's, it's great. You get to learn some things that we don't necessarily think about all the time, so. Thank you. Any other uh, reports? Go ahead. Yes, I just wonder if you would indulge me. I know um, we're on the tail end of Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, which ended yesterday, actually, but uh, I'd just uh, be remiss if I didn't um, wish everybody a uh, happy Heritage Month. I hope uh, you took some time to uh, reflect and honor uh, our, the heritage uh, of Hispanics in our community uh, as we are now the majority in the city and the plurality in the county. Uh, and I just want to highlight a couple of uh, pioneers uh, of Hispanic heritage uh, who have made a big a contribution in our community here. Uh, the first uh, has an elementary school named after him right down the street here, and that's John J. Herrera. He was uh, one of the leaders of LULAC back in the 50s and 60s and uh, did a lot to advance uh, civil rights for Hispanics. Another uh, is uh, someone who was elected, uh, one of the first Hispanics elected citywide, Lionel Castillo, uh, who is now passed uh, he was our city controller in the early 70s, went on to serve in the federal government as the INS director under President Carter, and then later uh, worked in the city, uh, at City Hall. But he was also the founder, a lot of people don't know, of, a, uh, of the Houston International University and was uh, very much an activist in promoting education, educational opportunities, educational uh, advancement in the Hispanic community and uh, someone who I uh, looked up to and worked with uh, had the pleasure of working with. Uh, and then the last is uh, Dr. Dorothy Karam, who's been a, uh, I think she's retired now from the University of Houston, but longtime professor, uh, but a leader for Hispanic opportunities, uh, uh, educational opportunities for Hispanics. She's the founder of 
the Houston Hispanic Forum. Um, and uh, I remember my mother talking to us about Dr. Karam and, and, and that she had heard a speech from her encouraging parents to make sure that they didn't uh, let anything get in the way of making sure our, you know, our, our kids got the opportunities to attend uh, college and university. So uh, on the tail end of Hispanic Heritage, I just want to highlight those three leaders, uh, pioneers in our community, uh, and I appreciate the, the opportunity to do so. One last thing, uh, any staff or, or parents, families that uh, suffered uh, from the hurricane a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was one of them. I got water in my house for the first time, uh, and so uh, I can personally relate to the challenges uh, when uh, someone is a victim of the floods that we, you know, are, seem to be getting more and more of here in Houston. But uh, finally, um, it was declared a uh, national disaster, and so FEMA is taking, um, you know, registrations, uh, the FEMA number to, if any of you have suffered and uh, hadn't heard, it's only been uh, de declared a, na a national disaster just like a week and a half now. Uh, the number is 1-800-621-3362, or you can apply online, as I have done, at disasterassistance.gov. And so my heart goes out to anybody past. Uh, there's, you know, many people that f have gotten uh, flood water in their house seem to be recurring victims. I know many people who flooded in Allison and flooded again in uh, uh, Harvey and now again in Imelda. So I just wanted to uh, mention, and I hope we have some uh, assistance, uh, any, at least moral assistance uh, for any staff here that has uh, been a victim of the floods and uh, anything that we can do to provide support. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee. Can too. Um, thank you. <clears throat> and uh, sorry for your loss. I didn't know that you had had a, uh, water. Uh, it all takes. Okay. Uh, last uh, one thing is the monthly financials uh, with Dr. Jesus Amesqua. Okay, so um, the financial highlights of uh, September 30, this is the, the uh, first month of the fiscal year uh, 1920. All our financials are posted on our website. Um, the uh, balance sheet as of September, we have assets of 32,735,921, liabilities of 1,968,087, and uh, liabilities and equity of 32,735,921. Um, the uh, fund balance, uh, we will update that in January. Uh, this is uh, preliminary based on 2018 uh, numbers. We also have excess uh, current revenue server resources for the first month of 1,355,669. Uh, the ratios, uh, here are the next four or five ratios. They're going to look a little bit different because it's the first month. It's just one month ex activity. Um, so the first uh, you, you see the, the percentages uh, uh, somewhat skewed at 667% versus 569 last year. Again, it's because it's just one month of, of, the, of the year. It's not the, the whole 12 months. Uh, working capital ratio, we're at 31 million versus 29 million last year. Um, the uh, unassigned fund balance ratio, we're at 69% versus 57%. Again, one month uh, only uh, for, for the year. Uh, debt to income ratio, we're at uh, zero percent. We haven't made any payments this year so far. The first payment will be in February 15. A fee for service ratio, we're at 27 percent. For last year, we're at 29 percent at the same time. And then the fee for service ratio growth, again, this is the first month. So we're at minus 21 percent. Again, it's just the first month, so that will correct uh, th throughout uh, the year. We budgeted at four percent for, for the year. Uh, fund balance activity, we had uh, had any uh, amendments. The first one is the, this month, and we will uh, present that in a, in a few minutes. The revenues uh, year to date are at 2%. Uh, general fund overall, um, $2,037,066. Um, budget uh, to, to actual or uh, revenue and appropriation, $113 million uh, uh, revenue uh, budget, appropriations of 128, which includes those PFC. Uh, funds that are 
uh, from the uh, for the AB West uh, project. Expenditures were at eight percent uh, again pro projected eight percent for the year. Ten million eight hundred two thousand and thirty seven dollars a month spent and encumbered. Um, our uh, donations for the month were twenty five hundred, primarily um, um, donations for TLC uh, school based therapy, uh, adult ed, and the Center for Safe and Secure Schools. Our values we're at uh, four hundred eighty four billion. Uh, the um, the amount certified has grown from 427 billion to 459 billion. Uh, we still have 24 billion left to uh, for uh, certification. The uh, um, uh, taxes uh, received for for the month were 50,448 and 6,404 payments to uh, HCAD and uh, the tax office. Again, the uh, taxes will probably start receiving those. Uh, in the month of November and December, so this is uh, uh, the statements are just uh, going out, so so we will not receive the the payments until about two months from now. Our disbursements for the months were two million forty thousand seven ninety five. All the uh, attachments and the uh, report is uh, included in your packet. Sixty nine checks, seven hundred sixty two transactions, and six transfers. Uh, segment information for the first month. We have certification, uh, education certification at uh, minus 17,152. Records management's positive 175,239. School-based therapy services, um, um, variance of uh, 870,725. And schools at uh, 1,130,223. Choice partners is at a 33% ratio at, uh, for a benefit uh, variance of 192,350 for the first month. Our budget amendments for the month are general fund for 445195 uh, grants at uh, $1,660,394, and capital projects of 50017 The first one is uh, uh, in the general fund, it's a uh, adjustment of the placeholder amount for uh, case uh, after school program, 25000 We had some rollover purchase orders from uh, last uh, fiscal year into the general fund, 320,197. We have uh, additional uh, facility audits uh, for school uh, safety audits, increase of 100,000 revenue and expenditure. And then we also have grants uh, that we're adjusting the uh, grant award for case, $191,061. Digital education, 7,714. Uh, again, the grant rollover for the Tecna Foundation, $30,040, and then a new grant received by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for the restoration of the Coolwood Head Start Center after Hurricane Harvey in the amount of $523,610. There are two agenda items related to this uh, budget amendment in the, um, in the agenda, one to, uh, for, for the application and also the acceptance of the grant, and this is the budget amendment related to, to that particular grant. Um, uh, additional grants received, uh, adult ed uh, rolled over for, for grants for the last fiscal year, 766342 and uh, in fund uh, 234 uh, from the Houston Galveston Area Council, 207419 And then a reduction in the case uh, uh, grant award uh, to reduce the placeholder for 65792 um, a rollover and open purchase orders for Fortis Academy for $50,017 from at the end of the fiscal year. Uh, in terms of the construction and the PFC update, uh, we had a PFC uh, committee uh, meeting uh, earlier. Uh, year to date expenditures uh, are $5,034,161.22. Uh, uh, by month, we have earned uh, interest of 440,151, of which 47,169 are restricted for uh, arbitrage uh, rebate. Our balance in the uh, uh, PFC account is 7,600,670. The uh, payments, um, and so this is over three payment uh, slides, all the payments from payment one all the way to payment 36 are 5034161 The payments for the month of uh, um, September were 1106847 
the uh, balance available are $7,401,069 uh, remaining funds as of September 30th. Uh, the uh, projection is to uh, substantial com completion is in January 2020. Um, and uh, the next uh, slide is the foundation update. Uh, we have uh, very little activity, 160,190 in terms of assets and liabilities and inequity uh, as of uh, September 30th. Uh, we only had one outlay of $30 in the uh, foundation. Um, up, uh, again, it's a service charge. And that's the report for the month of September. Any questions on the first uh, report? The second one is our investment report. Oh, oh just a second. Okay, you, you did the um, the Education Foundation? Yes. Okay, I did have questions about um, are we allocating as in, in that the 990 our contributions to the Education Foundation in our our labor, which is, I guess, the uh, yeah. we need to audits. make a, we need to record that in the in the current year um, uh, for this year's audit. Okay, uh, so and, we'll and was that. it reported last year? In the past, we've had very very little. Um, I don't I don't believe we had a uh, income because it was only a compilation last year. This year is going to be yeah, an I, audit. I guess yeah. There's probably no income, but other than in yes. kind contributions, right? Is, just is in kind doing. contributions, yes. And so we need to record that, uh, okay. uh, the, the level of expenditure or commitment from, from the department, yes. Thank you. Oh, sorry, it went back. The uh, investment report as of September 30th, uh, all our, uh, again, our financials and uh, investment uh, uh, is uh, posted on our website. Um, the uh, portfolio is 40678342 of which uh, the PFC is 7600601 uh, The majority of the funds are in Techstar, investment pool 79%, uh, Lone Star, and Tech pool. Um, 30 million uh, in, in pools are basically overnight. Um, in terms of the PFC, 99% in the uh, text pool um, out of the 7.6 million uh, 601. The uh, change from a year ago, uh, the uh, portfolio comparison, it is an increase of 4% or 1,671,413. Um, all our uh, funds are uh, overnight, 33 million 77,741. The uh, interest uh, earned uh, for the month were 54,967 for the HCDE and PFC 14,614. We've earn earned uh, 2.13, the benchmark is 1.84, so a little bit ahead of the, uh, of the curve. Um, the um, interest rates, uh, kind of remain a little stagnant there the last couple months, uh, uh, given some of the uh, issues with China and also some of the uh, uh, stock market uh, changes. And so they're still at the 2.10 to 2.15 range for short-term rates. That's the um, uh, presentation for the investment. Any questions regarding the, the report? Okay, thank you. Thank you, doctor. Okay, now we're going to uh, Action items, which is the consensus. Does anybody have uh, anything in the consensus that they'd like to pull uh, for a individual review? C10. Mm -hmm. Any others? D3 and D4. I, I had an amendment to the uh, minutes of last last month's meeting, uh, which was just a vote count. It wasn't any big deal other than the vote was uh, recorded on the minutes is 6-0. Um, that was item 5E, or, and uh, it was actually 7-0. So if, if without objection, we'll just make that amendment. Okay. 
All right. Uh, I need a motion to accept the consensus items, save C10 and D3 and 4. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor of the consensus items, save C10 and D3 and 4. Please raise your hand. I'm sorry, as amended with the amendments. Okay. So let's move on to C10. Oh, there we go. Just looking for clarity. I just wasn't quite sure what it was. That's it. Just a little clarity what it is. These are the inner local agreements uh, for governments to participate in our choice cooperative program. Uh, so uh, a uh, inner local agreement, say, for example, the city of Kennedy, they'll adopt an inner local agreement which allows them to buy off our contracts that are participate on their choice programs. Go. Uh, I, I move that we approve uh, item C10. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor of uh, consensus item C10, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Abstain. All right. Uh, you can too. Can you give us a brief on what you need? Yeah, same thing. Just some clarity. I uh, wasn't sure what the uh, uh, yes, uh, facilities consulting was for. Yes, the department, uh, we engage uh, sometimes the districts uh, will require some business consulting. For example, currently we're providing uh, business services consulting to Stafford Municipal. Uh, so they may need an, uh, an accountant or they may need uh, facilities uh, audits. Uh, and so we contract that with individuals and then we provide that consultant to them and we charge them a fee. So not necessarily for us? Uh, no, it's not for us. It's for, uh, to utilize, to provide services to other districts. Are these people being utilized, our employees, or, or no. outside? Outside. Okay. Any additional discussion? All in favor of D3 and D4, please raise your hand. So moved. <laughs> we didn't have a motion? Second. Okay. We got the motion and the second right over there. All in favor? Okay. Got it. Okay. On to the non-consensus items. Item A. <coughs> oh, I thought we, we did both of them at the same time. Did you have additional? Yeah, I have a question. I just wanted to hear some okay. details about what Project Grad was, kind of services they were going to bring to our after school. So this is similar to the choice bid process case for kids. The after school division also runs a bid process for anybody that wants to work in after school space. And so Project Grad runs after school le learning labs for college and career readiness. And so they have applied. Uh, we have about... 90, over 90 vendors that apply, so this is just them coming forward to the board as well. They have received money, um, you will see in different places, through City Connections, through the City Council Award as well. Thank you. Since that was included in the previous motion, are you okay with, do you want a separate vote? No, I'm fine. Okay. Okay, then we'll move on to the uh, non-consensus items. I may consider approve resolution adopting prevailing wages for HCDE public work construction facilities projects. So uh, moved. Second. Any discussion? Is this the same uh, item that we looked at in the PFC board? It is. It's exactly the same. Okay. Any additional discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Next item, uh, B, consider prohibition of the use of any HCDE resources in support of the Harris County Education Foundation, including but not limited to the expenditures of money, the preparation of foundation reports, submission of application for and implementation of foundation grants, or HCD employee servicing the foundation in any official or advisory capacity that HCDE employee may be 
designated as a foundation liaison solely for the purpose of receiving information on the foundation's activity. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay. Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Ms. Colleen Vera for bringing her concerns to us about the foundation. I think she had some valid points. Uh, as someone who serves on the foundation boards for Aldine ISD and for Lone Star College, I uh, do have a little bit of um, history with uh, some of the process, but uh, uh, I'm not sure I agree or understand why we would not want to use any HCDE resources to support our foundation. I mean, it's a, it's a two-way street. Uh, pretty much every uh, school district uh, either has an employee or perhaps several employees like Aldine that are hired specifically to run the foundation, to handle the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, obviously, at some point, the foundation gets big enough and uh, funded well enough, it perhaps could uh, pay for their own staff. But uh, ultimately, the foundation is, is uh, set up to support this organization and what we do and the services we're trying to provide to the community, to the school district. So uh, I, I'm not understanding why we wouldn't want to work together and, and make our foundation successful. So. Anybody has any input? Does is there a plan? Does someone have a plan for this, and could they explain the plan? What do you mean by plan? Well, I mean, uh, you know, what what are we looking? What how much money are we looking to put in there, or what's the what's what's the goal? What what are we looking to do with this? Um, yeah, on the so the next agenda item. I'll talk more about the implications of, um, you know, something that was started a few years ago. Um, but I did have a question about this agenda item. You know, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Trustee Cantu for his words. You know, in reading this agenda item, I'm struck by not understanding what the actual purpose of the item is. Um, I'm not sure what the expected outcome or what what the purpose of the item is it sounds like that obviously it, it says that we don't want to restrict any resources but the issue of directing personnel not to have any impact or influence or engagement with the foundation other than to receive information I'm confused by that I was hoping to get some clarity I can. I'm going to speak to this agenda item what this is an attempt to return our relationship with the Educational Foundation to the, what is normally conceived and practiced uh, by the Educational Foundations that they are to support the efforts of the department in this case and not to be supported by the department. Uh, what I've realized at the last meeting uh, at the Board of Directors of the Foundation was that HCDE was basically directing all the activities of the Foundation and providing the agenda, paying the expenses of, and uh, basically uh, uh, controlling the activities of the Foundation through their involvement. What I'm trying to do here is to redirect the foundation to uh, what was be normally be determined that the foundation would raise their own money, not provi be provided money by the department to operate, and that they would provide uh, money in a, in a way to support the, de the Department of Education instead of the Department of Education supporting them. Now, I would like to make a friendly amendment to this uh, in terms of the time frame, and I would be agreeable to saying that, that we would end this relationship by the end of this year, calendar year, and that any, any uh, problems found during that time as to what this agenda item would do, 
would be brought forward next month or in the December meeting and then we could vote on what the administration thought was the necessary relationship between these two. Uh, the superintendent sits as the secretary of the foundation so that there is this uh, possibility of communication between the two without involving all the employees of the department that are currently involved. I don't think that we should be, in effect, directing the activities of the foundation. That's not our job, and it's not really conceived, and I doubt that very seriously that it's part of the charter of the foundation. May I make a comment here? Um, I think what I'm hearing is a, a, a good discussion. However, I look at it as um, I know that there's been some rocky times with the foundation. I think there ought to be a time limit on uh, getting, giving them physical support. I definitely don't want to see us give them money. I think they have the responsibility to raise their money. But I think for, for a reasonable period of time that we are to give them help in making sure that they do get their submission of applications and grants and, and other places where we could help them to get off the ground. But in that reasonable time should be six months to a year, in my opinion, so that in that, that they are challenged to do this all on their own and uh, that we're out of it. But even today, I don't really want to give them the money. I think they need to go out and, and get their own on that. Just real quick, <coughs> I'm, I'm assuming with the language um, to ensure that HCD employees serving the foundation in any official or advisory capacity, that, is that in reference to Ms. Bartz and Dr. Mesqua? Yes. Yes, it is. It would well, not be uh, regarding you, Dr. Mr. Colbert, because you're you're an ex officio member, just like I am. They are. Too. They are. Well, maybe they shouldn't not be. So I, I guess so. I have a couple of issues, and, and one of them is, you know, I have pause in the board is essentially directing me how to direct my staff, and it's always been the tradition of any superintendent any school district that I've known that the the school the board of trustees supervise the superintendent in fact in the opening statement that the president reads every day every time we meet as trustees we're here to set goals listen to reports from the superintendent approve budgets contracts personal personnel appointments and make policy for the district it is not the role of the board to make day-to-day -day operational decisions the management of day-to-day -day operations of the department or the responsibility of the superintendent. This action item, the way it's crafted, is directing me to tell my executive leadership team what they should and should not do. And I have personally directed them to assist the board, the foundation, as many traditional school districts do, to um, be able to assist the foundation in its capacity until it's able to do it on its own. And so I guess what one of my concerns is, is I feel like that this kind of supersedes the superintendent and bypasses him to start directing employees exactly what they should and shouldn't do. Uh, let me talk to okay. you. I, I totally disagree with the, you about what you just said. This is a policy directive that we're, we are going to adopt a policy of not supporting the Educational Foundation with our resources uh, and uh, incurring expenses. We paid for all of their expenses for, for the last year, as best I can tell. We've filed their reports for them. We've prepared their reports for them. We've uh, basically taken over the entire operation of the Foundation uh, as very much evidenced by the last meeting of their board of directors where our employees were actually directing the board activities during the meeting. 
I've got a comment. You know, I've, I've, I was elected originally in 2006, and this uh, foundation has been here long before that. And as I recall, when I first came to this board, we were given a few hundred thousand dollars a year to that foundation to pay for their leadership, uh, for their salary. And as long as I can remember, our goal has been to get away from all of that, and we're still doing quite a bit. Well, Dr. Colbert, son, I mean, not excuse me, Dr. Colbert. Mr. Uh, Mr. <laughs> okay. In your opinion, how long would it take us to just so that you're not having to spend the resources of this department to really support the foundation? I mean, what is a reasonable time for us to support them and then get out and so that they're forced to go and manage this on their own? Well, that's a good question in light of them really just adopting essentially a new board not too long ago. I mean, they're in their infancy stages of trying to get on their own, yeah. which I is what your question that. is. And I, certainly I think you had mentioned a year. Um, I thought he said six months. Said six, six months to a year. Yeah, that's what I heard, a year. Yeah, six months to a year. And so... Um, you know, and Mr. Sumner's made a valid point when we had our feasibility study that he understands how foundations work. He actually gave an excellent description of how educational foundations work. Um, and then he also acknowledged the uniqueness of having a county foundation. Harris County Department of Education doesn't have a mascot. We don't have alumni. Yeah. It's not like Alding ISD where you know, Mr. Cantu is an alumni of Alding ISD, and he's going to go out. And, it's not the same. And so I, I had, to Mr. Wolf's point, I did disagree with the previous format of our foundation, and for that reason it got reformatted. Um, but I just, for the life of me, I can't understand why an entity doesn't value or trust you know, the foundation, which is a supplemental entity to support its very mission. But they're not supporting us, we're supporting them. But it well, should go both ways, though. But it's only going one way is the problem. Hmm. Here's my somewhat problem with it. I, I do think we need a foundation. I have, I have no problem with that. I do have a problem if we're giving them money when we could just give it to ourselves directly. Why go through mm -hmm. them and then back to us? Uh, so that's why I feel like they need to raise the money on their own. Yeah. Now, I'm okay with supporting them with personnel in, until they get into a point to where they can manage it on their own. I just have a real problem with giving them money and then they, you know, supposed to give it back to us when we know how to do it to begin with. And, and I would suggest we be careful of separating these two agenda items. Okay. So this first agenda item that we're discussing right now is basically to suffocate all support for the Education Foundation so it will whittle away. Yeah. I'm, that's what will happen to it. I'm not suggesting that that's what y'all are saying. I shouldn't say that. But the second agenda item speaks to a concept of Get HCDE giving money to the foundation so it can delegate it to ISDs. That's a separate agenda item, and we're going to have that discussion in a minute. And I think that's to the point of what you're talking about. But to direct staff from the board to not be able to engage in a directive given to them by the superintendent, there's a problem with that. And I respect that. I do. Okay, let me talk about that, though. If we did... This is a policy decision that HCD at some point does not want to support the foundation as we have in the past. During that period of time where we were giving them 200000 a year, they weren't raising any money for themselves. So it's basically, this is, so far this is just a continuation on a lesser degree at this point of what we've always done. We've never gotten anything from the foundation. We've always given money to the foundation. And this is an effort uh, to stop that practice. And if we decide as a policy for the board that we're not going to provide, uh, continuously provide money to them so that they can, in effect, operate, that's a policy decision. And that's not stopping the superintendent from directing his employees 
that's just stopping the practice of us incurring expenses and, and employee time supporting the foundation that has never been able to support itself. Say that this this item is not a policy, and and Mr. Summers, I actually agree with you to some extent. I don't think I don't think a foundation should be programmatic. It should be philanthropic, and I think it needs to be independent. The foundation was absolutely completely reconstituted. Its former president that we were paying the salary of, to your point, Mr. Wolf. Um, is no longer there. And but there's the, still board members there. Can right? I finish, please, Chair? And so, and then in addition to that, out of 22, 26 members of that board, all of them resigned with the exception of four. It was completely reconstituted. So we're trying to revitalize it in the new format. It's going to take a minute. It's just not, it's not like instant pancake mix. You're going to sprinkle water on it, and it's going to pop up as a full-fledged foundation. Having said that, to Mr. Cantu's point, I have sat on foundations on both sides. I've never seen a foundation that didn't have a liaison or someone who was associated from the ISD to help be the go-between between the ISD and the foundation. It's not uncommon. But I would love for the foundation to get to the point where it has its own you know, uh, supply. And that's, like I said, a separate agenda item. This agenda item is whether the board is going to agree to direct my staff not to do something. That's what the agenda item is about. Can I say one thing? Yeah. Sorry. I just want to alert the board, um, because it's relevant to this agenda item, that there is a current memorandum of understanding, a contract between HCDE and the Education Foundation of Harris County. And so I think this contract definitely has bearing on this agenda item and what would occur to the contract if this agenda item were passed. Um, and so I think that should be a topic of discussion as well. Um, I'd feel more comfortable giving you legal advice about that in executive session instead of in public, but that's at the board's pleasure. Well, can we uh, move this to be discussed in executive session when we get to that point? Uh, just let me ask you one question about that contract. Is it at will? It is the term of the contract, it began, um, it, it, well, to answer your initial question, it automatically renews, but there is a provision in the contract that says either party for any reason um, upon 30 days written notice may terminate the MOU with or without cost. Okay, so I don't think we need executive session. Okay, I mean that's at the pleasure of the board. I disagree, I think we, we do need executive session. Uh, I think to discuss the contract? Well, to discuss how this item no, you can't do that. Has, has an impact on the contract, because that's what okay. Gloria oh, just okay. said. Okay, hold on. I, I see. We're, I feel like we're dancing around some things that need to be answered before we can even have this discussion. And one of those is an AG opinion with regard to public funds going to a private uh, nonprofit. And uh, then we, if, if we can't do that, then a lot of this is moot. And with regard to the work that we are doing with them, which is thousands of dollars in accounting costs alone, and we're going to do an audit this year, I'm sure we're going to pay for that. Those are, those are items that, uh, one, need to be reported on their 990, and uh, two, we may not even be able to do that. So it's there are AG and opinions on point, sorry. Okay, and then on top of that, if we do start putting money into this thing, we lose our open records uh, ability for them because they are a separate entity altogether and we can't ask for them information. So if we give them $100,000, it's, it's gone. I mean, we, if, if, if uh, one of our citizens wants to uh, find out what happened to that $100,000, they don't get any information. They can't get that information. Whereas if we do something that we normally do, why would we have the Education Foundation do that when we can do it, and then it would still be transparent to everybody because they can ask those open records, like, where'd that 100000 go? And we can say, this ID, this SISD, this ISD, that's what we did. And, and that's why I'm saying we need a, a AG opinion with regard specifically to public funds to a private foundation, not a public funds to the ISD, because we've already found out that that's okay with the last AG opinion that we had, but we did not discuss the nonprofit. So there are AG opinions on point that discuss, for example, a school district's um, provision of office space, 
accounting, um, personnel, ex uh, copiers, as well as funding already um, to their education foundations. There are AG opinions um, on point um, about that, um, and in including there was a, a recent uh, case as well discussing yeah, and, and, and finding that these types of things, as long as the board finds that there's a public purpose served by that expenditure, and this is what the, con and it's memorialized in a memorandum of understanding, which this one is, um, that is, that is legal. It is not a gift of public funds. Um, and so there are AG opinions that directly address the provision of these types of things from an ISD, or in your case, a school district, to an education foundation. And with regard to the 990 that needs to be filed, which is an IRS regulation, not an AG mm -hmm. thing, these things need to be disclosed yeah, on the 990. I'm not a tax lawyer. I don't right. Worry and about and that's, that is <laughs> that is a problem as well, because then at least we'd have some modicum of disclosure and, uh, to, the, to the public. Uh, right now, we're, we, nobody knows that we're spent you know, $1,500 for a 990, and then who knows how much money was spent out of the uh, compilation for the EH EFHC uh, from the uh, accounting bill that we have for HCDE. And that's, I guess that's the point. We, we, we don't have any transparency on this, and it's a one-way vacuum that is not built to go the way it's supposed to go. We're supposed to gain and, and anything that they would do. I understand its infancy and the problems that they've had in the past, but at this point, I don't think we're in a place to, we, we need to stop the bleeding, basically, and, and figure out what are we giving to HCDE. Are we, are we just giving them a blank check and whatever they want to do? You know, I mean, I saw a beautiful PowerPoint uh, back in the um, meeting that we just had. Uh, it was an open meeting, but, you know, uh, nobody was there. Um, Mr. I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't see why we need to go to executive session to discuss this. Um, well, Mr. Colbert, uh, one thing I want to make clear is I'm for the foundation, and I'm for supporting them for a period of time, you know, with people. I'm not for giving them monies. However, uh, you know, maybe there are some at this particular point uh, that we do need to come up with some funds for them because they don't have anything to, to meet government requirements. I get that, and I'm not want to just cut them off at the knees for that. But what I would like to see is that we come back at least with a plan of guaranteeing how we could get this foundation on a sound footing and uh, how, what our relationship would be. And I do think we need somebody that is a liaison from this board uh, to that uh, foundation and, and that we really have a presentation of a plan that we can all support and get behind. The plan is to make them independent, fully yeah. independent. Yeah, yes, okay. yes. I'm not, I mean, I, I want to have a foundation that supports us and other things, and whether that's in uh, p part uh, C, uh, but I also want to know how that relationship works, and I do understand you've reconstituted. I respect that. I just want to see something that we can go to the public and say this is what we're doing on a very sound footing and that we're not here propping them up all the time. And that's okay. where I am. Okay. Dr. Moore, just to clarify, are you amending your motion? To, I don't to that think effect? I had an emotion. Well, I, I thought me. that you made the motion and Mr. No, Norris no, no, second. No. Yeah, you, you did. Mr. Moore did make the original motion for, for this agenda. Oh, oh okay, yes, so yes, are you yes. Amend, just to clarify for them, to make sure everybody's on the same page, are you amending your motion um, to state, um, to request a report, for, as you just described? Yes, I would like to come back and have a, however we can do that, not just a report, but something that we can vote on and support in, in whether that's next month, if we could do that. Okay. Okay. I can do that. Um, Mr. Norris, is, do you agree to that friendly amendment? Yeah. Thank you. I'd like to uh, actually make it an amendment to this amendment. Okay. That th this item be uh, tabled until next month as is and uh, give the superintendent uh, the, the month to uh, provide us with a plan to uh, allow us to stop uh, supporting the foundation in the manner that we are. I think that's basically what George was I, I thought well, that's kind of what I meant there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you give a time limit. 
Well, yeah. I said next next. Uh, you said if we could. Yeah. You said if we could next Let's, month, and he's like definite okay. next month. Okay. So, so just to clarify, if Dr. Moore and Mr. Norris are okay with that with the amendment, it would to state um, to request a report from the superintendent to provide a plan to allow HCDE um, to completely to stop the support of the foundation and to table this item until next month. I would say phase out for money, but s you know stop our to, uh, to phase out the funding. Yes. Okay. Mr. Norris, are you okay with that? Okay. And then that way it's a friendly amendment, so it doesn't require a vote. Any additional discussion with regard to the current amendment? Yes. Again, I just want to reiterate that the common practice of educational foundations involves uh, employees from that education organization actively working to support the foundation because it's a return on investment. Uh, Aldean ISD has two em full-time employees paid by the school district to run the foundation because that $150,000 investment is bringing in hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, and so that needs to be our goal is to, is to challenge our superintendent to make sure that what we're investing in the foundation is bringing resources back. And I think that's the difference. We can't just cut it, cut it off because the foundation exists to support our services and our programs. There's, there's opportunities to bring in private money to support our after school programs or perhaps our Head Start or, or our special education services. Uh, and the reason the foundation is necessary is because it draws in investment that someone would be able to get a tax write-off for instead of just giving money to a government entity. Yeah. So that's, that's one of the important aspects of it. Um, and so Lone Star College, I think they have three or four, maybe five full-time people that run their foundation. That foundation happens to have $30 million uh, in, uh, or over 20 in uh, endowments for scholarships. And so I know there's a new um, higher education program that U of H downtown is, is uh, developing for um, for basically for the special education population to be able to do something after high school. And so I see an opportunity for us to raise money to find a way to connect our, uh, the kids that we are educating through our special schools to go on to the next level. And I think that's a role that the foundation will be able to help us with. So we can't just cut it off and, you know, you mentioned stopping the bleeding. I think we need to, yes, we need to stop the bleeding, but uh, we need to give, challenge our, our uh, superintendent to give us a plan so that we can get behind it and make sure our foundation is successful. Don't disagree. Any additional discussion with regard to the postponement and uh, report requirement for next meeting? J just to be clear, so the plan, I guess the plan that we're asking for the superintendent to, to show is, is somewhere between what we've said all along, basically saying how do, how do we, what's the long-term plan for the foundation? How do we get it to fund itself? How do we what community? I just want to make sure we're clear. So, you know. So what I hear my directive being from my trustees is to by next month, the next board meeting, present to you a plan for how the Harris County Foundation will be independent of financial support from this governing body. And um, I think there's two categories that have come up here that we haven't clearly defined you have financial support which we're going to talk about that in a second but then we have personnel support mm -hmm. which is somewhat different still yeah. buddy i understand that yeah. i'm just saying that um <laughs> but what i want to do is just make a presentation you know i love everything that i've been hearing this is great discussion that you know how the, the, the foundation can be more independent and not reliant. I don't want to go back to the model that I just reconstituted it from. Well, I'm, I'm not against you. I'm not against people supporting it. Yeah. I'm just against direct funds going to it. And, I, and you present a plan that you think is workable. Well, that's, he can put that in his plan. <laughs> I've got one other comment. Um, the last time we really discussed the foundation, we had talked about trustees helping uh, formulate a list of people to appoint to that board. 
I think that may be something we want to revisit. Well, that's part of, you're talking about having a report regarding that, and then I'd like to see some information on that. I think you need to request that. Yeah, that's point. a shift in topic. Yeah. Well, it has to do with the Education Foundation, and uh, we've discussed it in the past, so I'd like to see that. It was my understanding that the request of the superintendent was to provide a plan of the financial support, not the, how we choose the candidates for the committee, for the foundation. That's a separate topic in my mind. Any additional discussion with regard to the motion? Can we get it read back? Because it seems like it's morphed mm -hmm. like a thousand times. I don't even know. Um, can we get a clear statement of what it is so we can make sure we know? Absolutely. So what I have down, um, and Melissa, please correct me if you have something different, um, is the motion as amended um, is to request a report from the superintendent to provide a plan to phase out funding of the Education Foundation of Harris County and to table item 7B to next month. Is that correct? Uh, Dr. Hesmesqua. I, I wanted to provide some context and information about the foundation because there's uh, discussions about um, my, our work in the department in supporting the foundation. We do the accounting for the foundation in the business office. So we're going to start a, an audit process that is undergoing right now. And so should you come back next month and say, well, we're going to stop that, it's going to be in the middle of the audit process, uh, an audit which they do not have probably the financial means to pay for it. On the other hand, we do accept money from the endowment, which we need to make sure that we stay under uh, and make sure that it is uh, a, a foundation that is a 501c3 that meets all the requirements. Otherwise, it jeopardizes our ability to receive money from the foundation in terms of the endowment. And we've been receiving approximately 100000 a year for the last three years. And then we're about to em embark on an application and the, the foundation is not a viable option in support of the foundation from accounting standpoint. We're going to lose that funding over there. And I'm just saying we're about okay. to go into something that you're going to mess with an accounting function that I'm not going to be able to then come back to you and say, we have to cut and meet the 100, 300,000 over there because we can meet a f the designation of a 501c3 because the endowment is pulling out. Dr. Thank, thank you, Dr. I'm Mesker. just Mesker. Mesker. giving you a yeah. little bit of, okay. I'm trying to <laughs> figure out how we're going to do in terms in-house, and I don't mean to be a little overexcited. No, it's just speak. we do the work, <laughs> and, no, and at some point, okay. you know, I, I just need to okay. provide that information to so, you. So that should be part of the report, that there's actually money coming in through the foundation. Yes, sir. In fact, and that, that, should, that, that in and of itself should, you know, uh, compensate for the amount of money that we're spending. Because, it, you know, when you're talking, talking $10,000 in staff and supplies and material, all that stuff, it pales in comparison to the $100,000, $300,000 is what you said. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, those are the kind of things we need to know. Hey, uh, and, and why hopefully, I brought it up. You yeah, know, just so that you can have the and data to make a decision on something that you're going to have on an agenda that's going to have an implication on another division on their function and on their ability to operate. I hope I'm a reasonable guy here. I don't want that to happen. That ought to be a part of the plan, how we make this Thank sustainable. You. Sure. I think that's okay. information we've never had before. Yeah. Well, uh, but but the money stays in the foundation, and we don't know what the money's going for because of the of the uh, open meetings or the the uh, disclosures. So that, so one of the lack things. Of I'm yeah. sorry. One of the things that I have been doing is you see that we provide financial payments for the foundation because we want to make sure that you know what's happening over there too, what's coming in over there, what's coming this way, and they have right now a little over 160 thousand that is going to eventually find its way over here through some you know, on checks, and that we handle those checks, and we deposit those for K's, for TLC, for Head Start, for the different programs that they fund. Um, and so we're just, we see the pass-through, and we see all that activity going on, and I just want to make sure that you're aware of that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, as long as it's, as long as it's the other direction, because we've, we've yes, been funding them, yeah. and, and I understand all this other little stuff, uh, but uh, when we're talking about actually getting some things done, sure. we need to know that we're going to be supporting something that's not going to be a drain. Okay. I agree. Okay. 
Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of? Back. Do we ever get the read back? Yes. Okay, just, just one more time. <laughs> yeah, all in favor of? Go ahead. It. Okay. Um, to request a report from the superintendent to provide a plan to phase out funding of the Education Foundation of Harris County and to table item 7B to next month. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Very good. Thank you. On to the next item, which is similar to the other. Discuss possible action regarding HCDE providing funding to the <coughs> Education Foundation for in support of scholarships and grants to Harris County School Districts. So moved. Second. We can discuss. Any discussion? <laughs> well, wh why he's can't. First, he's first. Who? I, Who? Okay, I was ahead. first. I ran track. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I'm gonna do a small little history lesson here. October 18, 2017, um, we had an item, I believe it was 7F, seven, seven and it reads like this, consider the creation of an HCDE fund called the HCDE Harvey Relief Grant uh, to benefit the ISDs in Harris County, their teachers, faculty, their students, their families who were impacted by the Harvey Flood disaster. Agenda item was submitted by Eric Dick, George Moore, and Mike Wolf. Agenda item 7G, uh, this is also October 18, 2017. Consider the creation of the HCDE fund called HCDE Harvey uh, relief grant for employees of HCDE to benefit our employees who were impacted by the Harvey flood disaster items submitted item agenda submitted by Eric Dick George Moore and Michael Wolf at that time this item got tabled because there was a concern that there might be an issue with a gift of public funds and so we sought out the AG opinion and so in um, November 29th of 2017, we got the AG opin opinion and the AG said that you could actually do that. This department could give money back to the ISDs. It was at that time that I proposed to the board that instead of just giving money to the ISDs or just to employees because it'd be difficult to know what the impact, especially employees, would be or to the specific ISDs, and then some of the superintendents were concerned that this would conflict with their FEMA recovery funds, that why don't we instead take that money and send it to the Education Foundation, who could distribute money back to the ISDs in the form of grants, scholarships, and sponsorships, that we could support the ISDs in a supplemental flanking way, and should, instead of just giving them a check, which they're going to absorb straight into the budget and not one child would directly be impacted by it. The board at the time said what it did today, basically present a plan, show us what that looks like. So I got together, we created a plan, we had a feasibility study, we went over the feasibility study and then the concern was, well, who is on the foundation board? What does the forms look like? Blah, blah, blah. The ISDs were all over it. They're like, this would be great. We would love to get su support for all things got a golf tournament coming up. Why can't you be an, a whole sponsor or, or pay for a team? I just got that request from spring. And so we went back and tried to formalize the processes. We even allocated money, $500,000, then put it to the side that it would directly go to the foundation. It wasn't designed to support the foundation it was designed to be able to go back and help people in Harris County. That was the inception. It was never, the thought wasn't, let's create this to support the foundation so it can stay alive. Obviously, it was kind of to give it a jump start and maybe it could get matching donations and ultimately get to the point where it wouldn't need any contribution, but it was really a way to give money back to the citizens of Harris County in the form of grants, scholarships, and sponsorships. 
That money has been sitting there. We have budgeted for it, but it has not been released to the foundation for them to start taking in applications. Today, we had a feasibility committee right before this board meeting. And in that feasibility committee, we presented to the board the online application process that wasn't active, but it is already formalized for how someone would submit a grant or a request for a scholarship for us to release the money. To my surprise, prior to us having this meeting, you know, I had the agenda item that was basically, you know, completely against the grain of all of this with the foundation. So there is a conflict with that. But the, the idea was never to create money to support the foundation. It was to find a way and let the, the foundation be the, the gatekeeper, the ref that determines how the money gets distributed. So it's not coming directly from the board. I'm afraid that if the board determines this school district gets money, this kid gets money, this one doesn't, whatever, it's going to bring in all kinds of problems, potentially, of people thinking that, you know, Well, at least, at least those problems will be public and transparent. If it goes through the Education Foundation, then it becomes into a dark room where we don't know what happens. Yeah. So we, there's nothing that you explain that we could not do ourselves as HCDE. And, and that is... That is, again, we're trying to stop that money that way and let them bring the money here where we can sit there and publicly disclose, pu be completely transparent with everyone. And that's, you know, the, you're, you're suggesting nothing here that we can't do already. M M Mr. Colbert. Oh, well, go ahead, George. The item that we used to discuss a while ago was about really operations. And so that's to me, is different than this. Yeah. I totally agree with you that I don't want to get into the business, really, of choosing which school districts and which kids and, and whatever, because that does create some tension on it. If we have a foundation, I'm willing to let that foundation make those decisions. That's what they're there to do and to keep us out of trouble with it. And so I, I have no problem with this item of of that happening. What I do have a problem with is, <laughs> is the operations which we've already discussed. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I do think that us being hands off in this case is better for us as a board. Yeah. What my concern is, is the moment y'all grant a scholarship to a district that you live in and you don't grant one somewhere else, that's going to be a problem. And I, or there's some politics that gets involved. It's not a safe place to be. It's ha I, I understand the president's concern about transparency and this, that, and the other, and he has articulated that quite well. But I'm just concerned, just knowing how ISDs are and parents or whatever, it's going to be a problem the moment you tell someone no. Yeah. And then they're going to want to know why. I'd like to hear Mr. Can Richard Cantu's comments on that. Yeah, no, I think that, um, oh, sorry about that. I disagree, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, there are some things that we can't do as a government entity. Uh, going back to Harvey, uh, millions of dollars were donated to J.J. Watts Foundation, to the Houston Community Foundation, uh, and, you know, it's easy to get all that money, but and then how do you distribute it? How do you make sure it goes to who needs it? That's why... Uh, the Houston Community Foundation, which is a, which is a, a attached to, sort of by a dotted line to the city of Houston, much like our foundation is attached to us, um, because money was coming in, you know, um, between the county judge and the mayor calling out for those corporate donations. Uh, and so they put out a call and asked all the foundations, the local community foundations, school district foundations, to apply to help distribute that money to the people that need it the most. And so, for example, some of that money came to Aldine Foundation and because they put a plan together that said we know which of our students, which of our families, which of our janitors and staff and teachers flooded and need some assistance. And so that's why uh, it's, it's important for us to have a foundation because uh, if something like that happens again in the future, you know, we'll be able to make sure through our foundation, Mr. Wolf is on that board, uh, Mr. Colbert and has staff liaisons, uh, to make sure that we can provide information. And that's why it's important to have staff coordinating 
So we can give them lists of the Head Start kids and families, the, the special school kids and families that perhaps may need some of that support. Hold on, we can't, well, how, far as money donating, and I, f I forget how this, um, I know typically the foundations are nonprofit, but the question is, if we receive money as a foundation, they can write that off. Can they, can they donate it to HCDE directly and, and do the same? Yes. And I am not a tax lawyer. <laughs> My malpractice insurance won't let me give tax advice. Um, on well, memory, though, the, the, the why the reason foundations were started, particularly for educational entities, was to, in order to ha receive, to donate, if an entity or an individual donated to that 501c3, they received a tax write-off, um, and then that the foundation could more easily s provide in either in kind or in straight checks, et cetera, to the school district and not, for example, have to go through procurement rules. They could just go buy the smart board for your local elementary school, um, et cetera. I don't, I'm unaware if, a, in, if an individual or entity gives um, something directly to the governmental entity, if that is similarly um, subject to a tax write-off. I think Dr. Abesco would know the answer to um, that question. Yes, it could, but, but there are some foundations that prefer not to give to a tax, uh, a tax uh, levying entity um, and so they prefer to go to a foundation rather than to a city, a county, a school district that has the ability to levy a tax. And so that's usually a lot okay. of foundations prefer not to do that because of, of that. They, they, they say, you know, you are, have the ability to tax, so, uh, so they prefer to give to a, to a, a and foundation. We're, and we're talking about one direction, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the problem we have is the opposite direction, mm -hmm. and for some reason we put a, a nice little lipstick on this guy and say, hey, there's not going to be, this is going to be the purest entity of all time, and they're going to do everything right in the cloak of darkness mm -hmm. is, is kind of naive to me. Uh, that's why we have the open records thing that we have here. So if, the, if they raise their own money, then they can dictate what they want. But if we're sending public monies to them, I want the light of day shining on it, and the only way I see that that's going to happen is if we make the decisions here uh, with the tax dollars and allow them to spend whatever they want to, whatever dollars they want to that they raise separately. This stuff, it should be the, the, the um, office and staff time, supplies, CPAs, and all that stuff, that should be disclosed separately that that's what we're doing, okay, because that's the transparency. And I, and I really don't have a problem with that as long as they are producing something. If this is the only expense item and they're not doing anything, I have a problem with that. But to sit there in this idea that, oh, we're going to create this foundation and it's just going to be beautiful and everything's going to be wonderful and peachy, we already know from history that that's not the case. I mean, we had when you first started, and there's no reason that in 10 years, how many years has this foundation been around, 20 years, something like that? that we won't fall right back off when the next president comes on or the president after that or something like that. And when, when we get that respectability uh, where we just continue, we don't want to do that with taxpayer dollars. That's, that's my point. Can I just say one quick thing? Um, just so the board is aware, you know, whenever this was first brought up, uh, which is 2017, is that? Yep. Um, Dr. Mesco and I worked together to draft a memorandum of understanding between HCDE and the foundation for, I think we were calling it the Inno Innovative Zone Grants, is that right? Um, and included in that memorandum of understanding were requirements for the Education Foundation to provide information to the department um, with periodic reports, um, with access to record, that for the department to have access to records, um, et cetera. And so I think that's somewhat addressed. Are they subject to the TPIA? I don't believe that they are under the law. Um, but in terms of the department having access to information, particularly relating to this expenditure of the funds and the grant process, et cetera, that's a creature of contract and was in the draft um, that Dr. Amesqua and I had, had worked together to do. So we can, we can stipulate where, how that money is used and going to the board? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm good. I would, uh, I would like to see this table until next month when, as the superintendent pointed out, a couple years ago when we discussed this, there was discussion of uh, appointing people to that board as recommended from this board and we never got any feedback on doing that. So uh, 
I would like to table this to next month until we get that other report also. So you're you're saying that this is contingent on who the board members are or the board have saying that definitely impacts it. I'm not saying that I agree we should send them money, but I think there's other things like Mr. Sumner's had suggested earlier. I think maybe doing a matching thing where if they raise money then come ask us for matching funds. Uh there's just all different kinds of ideas we could come up with. I'm just I guess I'm not clear on what I think this is just is. a table it's not there's no correct your plan that's all I want, I want to hear a plan doesn't sound like there's really a plan but I think um, you know you'll get a plan together by next month so I'm fine with tabling this any additional discussion with regard to tabling all in favor of tabling please raise your hand that is till next month next item Consider approval of service contract for job number 19055YR for Choice Partners Consulting Services for the, with the following vendor, SGSGLLC. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Motion passes. Next item, consider second reading and approval of revised policy BED local. Uh, Ms. Langlois, do you wanna? Sure. Um, this is the, the board had the first reading for revised policy BED local last month. Um, these revisions were necessitated by a change in the law, um, that, a statute that was passed this past legislative session to amend the Texas Open Meetings Act to require public comment um, at every board meeting, um, at least for agenda items. And so that necessitated a revision to BED local um, that now addresses public comment on agenda items, which is now le required under the law, and then public comment on non-agenda items, um, which would be at regular board meetings only. Do we need a motion for this? Yes, please. Okay. Second. We, Any discussion? Have we been provided with the, the revised, revised? It's the same as last month's. Um, this is just a second reading. This is the second reading, okay. and I believe. Yeah, we discussed it last meeting. Scout, but you provided the, the copies well, we to the board. Do it. Yes, okay. Okay. Any additional discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay. Next item F. Consider adoption of resolution concerning emergency administrative leave with pay in accordance with policy DEA local. Would that be with you, Ms. Langwell? Who, who does? There we go. Thank you. Do we need a motion? Yes, please. So moved. Second. Please what explain. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> this was a policy change that the board approved last month. Um, local board policy DEA local authorizes the superintendent to provide emergency administrative leave with pay to employees due to inclement weather. So last month we had flooding in the Houston area and the superintendent made the decision to close some Head Start centers and may also made the decision to close that Friday due to flooding in the Houston area. So now board policy requires the board to pass a resolution kind of declaring the purpose, um, the public purpose served by uh, providing emergency administrative leave to staff. Any discussion? Do I have a motion? You already do. Okay. Uh, any seeing no discussion, all in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Item G, consider approval of agreement with Houston ISD to provide breakfast and lunch for school divisions ABS East, ABS West, and Fortis Academy. So moved. Second. Any discussion? I would like to hear a, an explanation of this. In the past, uh, the uh, Houston ISD would uh, provide uh, free meals. They changed that last year, and so uh, we now have to uh, pay them, uh, you know, uh, a fee for for providing the breakfast and the lunch. 
And so they, sometimes uh, HISD's contract takes a little long to come back. Um, and so, it, it, you know, we just received it back. And so now we're providing that to get the approval from, for the board. Uh, why would they be providing free meals in the past? It because they, they changed their, their application with the Texas Department of Agriculture where they uh, now they're no longer able to offer uh, free meals to uh, outside, you, just to, to inside of the, of the district. And so it's a grand change for them. Okay. I, I guess my question is, were they providing meals to all of our students or just the HISD students within our? All of them. Okay. Get from what you said that the, but they were being reimbursed by the yes. Texas Department of Education for doing that. Now, now they're, they're not. not. Yeah, that makes sense. Will we be getting reimbursed from? The we're Texas in the staff? process of developing an application for ourselves, okay. so that we can do that the same. But in the meantime, we have to do this. Yes. Okay. It is included in the fee that we charge uh, for for those schools already. But we're going to try to recoup that through other means as well. Okay. Any additional discussion? All in favor for item uh, 7G, please raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, now the fun one. What's fun um, about it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, discuss and possible action to fill ACDE trustee position 1, precinct 2. Do I have a motion? I'd like to make, <coughs> make a motion that we uh, select Tom Cotter to. Uh, replace George Moore at, at the open position, and it, I guess he's get to serve the balance of George's term. Do we have a second? I'll second that since he was the only applicant that I know of. Any discussion? Thank you. Yeah, and, and we we create a process, but I just don't think that this process uh, really served its purpose as the only person that applied was the person that y'all were suggesting before. The whole purpose of a process where, is where the general public could, uh, you know, apply and where we'd have a pool of people to apply instead of the person that um, select board members want to, um, to uh, get there. I also have just kind of a problem with, uh, with I don't know, it kind of smells like a walking quorum. Whenever you have uh, people keep on pushing the same thing over and over again, and they, they're kind of voting a certain way, that was the whole purpose of having a, a process where no board members would, would you know, have any influence on it. So I, I have a high level of reluctancy, and it doesn't really pass. This, this, the way that it went, it, we clearly didn't get a, a pool. We only had one single person apply. And I think if we actually want to be transparent, we should, you know, at least just create some type of system where there's more than one single person that uh, you know board members previously pushed. It doesn't seem like it's transparent at all to me, but that's just my humble opinion. Just some added information. I actually forwarded an email today to Melissa. Um, Marvin Morris had sent a formal request to me via email, and so I forwarded that today. So there is more than one, but there's a chance you probably. I, sent it to you probably at 10 o'clock today. What's that? Cut off date, okay. Yeah. Well, there was someone else that we, applied. We established a process last month that this would be done under, and Mr. Dick, you had it at a, a month's opportunity to provide or to contact somebody else that you think might have been uh, available, as did all the trustees. Uh, we can go on and on and on forever if uh, uh, we basically stop the process because you, you uh, didn't comply with, with the, uh, the process that was established. So what you just said is basically that you pushed the prior guy you wanted before and then you decided you wanted to push him again. You pushed him, it sounds like. You worked together with other trustees had a meeting of the minds and pushed this candidate to apply. What I was trying to trying to have is a transparent process, not a corrupt process, what this sounds like it is. Well, I was trying to have, and uh, you spoke, and please let me speak. If you, wouldn't, if you wouldn't may, I was trying to have a process where the general public, 
where I thought we were going to put something in the Chronicle or some type of newspaper and have the general public apply and have somebody free from you know, any of our involvement. But it seems like that that's not going to happen. You just want to push you know, whoever you guys just want to have, just push them through. So, I mean, and you jump up and down your soapbox, oh, we're, we're, the whole department's so corrupted, oh, no, you know, it's not transparent enough, blah, 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 and then you turn around and you do the exact same stuff. I'm tired of this hypocrisy, the lies, I'm tired of the lies. Why can't we just be honest? Why do you just have to sit here and lie? I'm sick of it. I've got a question for our board attorney. Uh, was the ad put out in the Chronicle? Was the ad placed in the Chronicle? No, sir. Where was it placed? It was placed um, at the courthouse and all advertised on HCDE's website. Okay. And as, as a general rule, I, I think the general rule typically, and I, in, in management typically, is when you get application, it, if, if you happen to get one application, typically you do, sometimes you do extend the deadline just to make sure that you actually have a pool. So there is a, there is typically, that's typically, in management, you may extend the deadline if you get one application, not just to say that uh, sometimes we do extend the deadline. So I know that that happens on that, in that regard. So I don't, I don't have an issue with, I mean, we have, we do have an applicant and that's fine. I, I think, and that, so we're, we're good, but I think it, it may not be a bad idea just to make sure that we do have, we do get the word out a little bit more to make sure we have an a pool, application pool. I just have one comment before somebody uh, uh, claims that someone, uh, violated the law, that they need to have some evidence that they did. I didn't talk to anybody about uh, this until I was notified that the only participant or the only application was from Mr. Cotter. Uh, the, we set the, the criteria last month because we were at a dead end situation on replacing George. And uh, everyone had a chance to comply with that uh, criteria. Uh, this this can just go on forever and ever uh, under the cir circumstances of a, of somebody on our a trustee claiming that other trustees had co colluded with with uh, themselves to bring this up. I we had specifically set up the process so that we wouldn't know what was going on until we were notified by uh, the department as to who had applied. So I, I, ter I really, really object to your uh, claim that we colluded when, it, when, when it's pretty evident, at least in my mind, that we did not. I didn't talk to anybody else about it. And uh, you keep on making these kind of comments at these meetings that you have no evidence to support. And I, I don't appreciate it at all. Release your cell phone records. Give, 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 uh, give the department your cell phone records, and we could see all the times you've called Mike Wolf and all the times you know y'all have communicated. That, that's if you if you say yeah, didn't you? There's no there's no issue. Give a, give up your cell phone records. So would I if I had talked to Michael Wolf? Would that would that be a walking quorum? Hell no, it wouldn't be. So I didn't talk to Josh. I didn't talk to George. I didn't talk to you. I didn't talk to Richard, and I didn't talk to Dave, and I didn't even talk to Michael until yesterday. Well, if you talked to him yesterday, who and else has Michael the talked date, to? The date had already gone by for for reporting yesterday. The only the only trustee I've spoken to uh, was Don. If I may, uh, just because of the fact that we had a now uh, recognized. Uh, federal national disaster, I think it was two days after our last board meeting. Uh, I did plan on uh, sending out a message or, or, or several to, to various groups to help get the word out that there's a vacancy that we were looking folks to apply for, but uh, my house flooded, so I was, I've been a little distracted. Uh, and perhaps others who uh, may have um, thought about applying, you know, Precinct 2 was one of the hardest hit areas of our county. So I think just because of that, I think it makes sense to, to extend the, the deadline to get some more applications. Ultimately, it could be the same pick, but I, I, but I think the, the extension is not. So, so yeah, I'm, I move to amend the, the uh, 
well, I guess it's not a, it's not a, a is that an amendment? need a substitute. Was that a substitute amendment? Okay, yeah, substitute amendment to postpone. Uh, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't actually made or second, but it was considered. Well, wait so. a second. He, you are, you got the motion, yeah, for seconding. That's just, that's just an amendment to postpone the vote. It does not an amendment to change the criteria. Is the, what, what is the purpose of, of, of the motion? Is it just to table this item or is it to extend the deadline? To, to for to receive applications to or to yeah. reopen actually because the deadline's already passed or to reopen to reopen okay so, so I, I guess to postpone the vote and to and and to reopen the the um and to, to extend the deadline to receive applications uh to, to make sure we receive until um the same time period maybe the monday prior to next month's board meeting so that would be november 18th can we, can we make it on the Friday so that it might be able to Are make our disclosures? November 15th? Sure. Okay. Sure. So it's a substitute motion to reopen um, the application process. Sorry, I'm writing as I'm talking. Um, to receive applications for HCDE trustee position one, precinct two, um, until noon on Friday, November 15th, and to table this item until the November board meeting, the regular board meeting. Yes. Could we, could we also put the Chronicle ad or, or like what we talked about before? And to add, and to add the addition. It's like, like how we talked about we were going to do that before? Advertisement. It didn't make the final motion last time. The, the, what made the final motion last time was to post notice at the courthouse and to advertise on HCD's website, so that's what was done. But, of course, if you guys want to expand that to include an advertisement in the Chronicle, you certainly sure. may. So we can, you, okay. Sure. Um, so we and, can. Mr. Norris, you need a second to your substitute motion. Second. Okay. Um, and how often, how many times do you want an advertisement in the Chronicle? The, the the public for if it's if it's a per, for to take an analogy for procurement, uh, we advertise our procurements um, legally. You're obligated to advertise those once a week for at least two weeks. So that's a standard if you want to use that. But you're happy to do anything else because you're not required to do anything. Well, I think we should at least do it, at least that, if not more. Okay, uh, once a week for three weeks. Once a how, week. how many weeks do we have to the next to the next time? <coughs> Well, and I know it takes, like, you, you won't be able to get it in the Chronicle this week because it takes a while for the, to notify the Chronicle. Um, and so not counting this week, the one, two, three, four weeks. So four so weeks? Four we for the next, once a week for the next four weeks. And I have a question, I guess, and a comment. Could we also ask the administration through the communications office to send out a press release that the board is seeking applications or the HCDE is seeking applications. Maybe a Chronicle little blip, little story, you know, with a headline, HCDE seeking uh, applicants for to fill board vacancy precinct two would catch more eyes than one of those boring, you know, where normally all the RFPs and, hey, I read and those. bids. And <laughs> I said I read those. <laughs> Okay, so if the if it's an acceptable, um, friendly amendment, just to make sure that we get all of this to the motion, um, the substitute motion is to reopen the application process to receive applications for HCD trustee position one, precinct two, until noon on Friday, November 15th, to table this item until the November regular board meeting, um, to add um, the an advertisement in the Houston Chronicle, um, uh, once a week for the next four weeks and um, to send out a press release regarding the receipt of applications. Okay. Any discussion? I, I just uh, need to clarify my vote. I'm not going to vote for this because we've already set up a process. We've got an applicant here. Everything has been done properly and uh, we should move forward. So you will get my vote for no. But any other discussion? All in favor of the motion presented by Dr. Norris and Mr. Cantu, please raise your hand. All those opposed? Please raise your hand. 
And I, it and does I'm, not pass. I'm abstaining because yes. I'm right. involved. <laughs> yep. Uh, okay, so now we're back to the original motion, which was um, Tom Cotter to replace uh, Dr. Moore. Um, any discussion with that regard? Hearing none, all in favor of Tom Cotter replacing Dr. Moore, please raise your hand. All those opposed? No actions taken. We have no abstention. Yeah. We have no executive session. Is that true? That is correct. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Motion made. Any second? Second. All in favor of adjourning, please raise your hand. All right. Agreement. Okay. Thank you. Oh, it's uh, three fifteen. Yeah, who's, 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 who's